Okay, what'd you come up with? Fire away. <coughs> Rent. Rent. Employees. Inventory. Good. Employees. Employees. Advertising. Um, advertising. Equipment. Equipment. The vendors. Vendors. And if you say if you've got other equipment, if you guys set a cooler or something, tell me what you got. Let's just load oh. this thing up. Uh, there's two types of lifts. There's different ovens. There's fryers. There's. I worked at a grocery store this morning. Okay. Uh -huh. Keep going. What damages? Good. Um, water both coming and going. What's that? Water coming and going. Water. What do you mean? Like, because you get charged to have water come in, and then for like toilet water, it also. Oh, gets for utility. So, uh, water for utility, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Water and drainage. Yes. What? Insurance. Insurance. Good. Depreciation. Depreciation. Whenever people steal stuff. Stealing, loss, leakage, food spoils, spoiled food. Maintenance. Maintenance. Security. Security. Transportation. Transportation. Taxes. Taxes. What else? Licenses. Licenses. Good. Are we burning out? Anything else back there? What did you guys come up with? Other things to add to the list? We already did say utilities. Like general infrastructure, like their shelving and everything. Okay, shelving. Unexpected breakage on equipment. Breakage, maintenance, break, equipment. Uh, you mentioned stealing, so maybe some legal fees, attorney fees, that sort of thing. All right, that's, that's good enough. So now, what I want to think about is what we are in business to do. What does this grocery store do? I mean, how do they, how do they make money? They sell products. They sell products, right? So if we go back to profits, profit equation is what? Price, total, total revenue. Total revenue. Minus total, total cost. All right, so this exercise was to kind of highlight all the various types of costs. And by the way, this is dipping into chapter 11 stuff, which your homework for 1011 is posted now for Sunday night. So we still got some time, but just FYI. So our total cost kind of represents a whole bunch of stuff in our business. And we want to keep our eyes on the ball at the same time about what our total revenue is. Now, in a multi product grocery store, it's price times quantity, but we have thousands of products potentially, right? So it's really kind of the sum of PI times QI from I equal one to the number of store number of things in the store, a thousand or whatever. So just kind of a short, compact notation that you probably saw once upon a time. They're like, what? What's that Greek symbol all about? So we're gonna add up all of the revenues in the store. Now Let's just kind of think about that for a second as just this aggregate Q of product. What types of costs change with the amount of product that's going out the door every day? What sort of costs change with the amount of product going out every day? Does the rent change? No. Do the utilities change? Yeah. Uh, if you have more people in the store, the refrigerator is really high. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, there might be a little bit, but do they vary a lot? No. Probably not. But if there's more stuff, more people opening up the cooler door, like you're saying, they might have to kick on more. So there might be a little bit of small, but for the most part, that one doesn't change. Um, the amount of lights that we have running to keep the store lit, you know, all of that stuff is about the same, the amount of heat and AC that's coming through. So, mostly fixed. Inventory. That's yes. Right. That is going, right? So that's changing with the amount. Our inventory on the shelves is kind of a direct relationship between that. Employees and labor. Yes. Yes. They hire a lot more in the summer and at Christmas time. Okay. 
So what about on a given day? Like on just any given day, not really. Eight so hours of labor, we might have a mix. Who who are we? Didn't really break that. You guys didn't break that down too much. But talk to me about these employees. What what's their composition? Who who's in our grocery store? Bag boys yes. or girls? Stalkers. Stalkers. Not the kind that are on Facebook looking at every move of yours, but the actual stocking the shelf stalkers. What else? Cashiers. Cashiers. Manager is one person I was kind of looking at. Anybody else you could think of? Deli workers. Deli workers, so other people. All right, so that, that pretty much covers the type of employees. So do we need more managers when business is good on a given day or business is less on a given day? No, right? The manager has their shift and... So who's most likely to be uh, uh, cut short if business is a little slow? Of that list we just gave out, who can you imagine if, hey, you know, it's, it's a slow day today, why don't you just punch out? Yeah. Who are we telling that to? The baggers. The baggers, the baggers the and the cashiers probably, right? Those people that are right on the cash <laughs> register that are directly related to that, they're potentially the ones that might get cut. Now you can't perfectly cut them like, oh, this is a little slow, and then you cut them, and then a big, you know, a, new, a bus pulls up, and all of a sudden you're busy, and you need more cashiers, and you can't call them back. So again, that is something that has some variability, uh, depending on who it is. But we might want to add a manager on here that wouldn't be circled. We'd probably have a fixed. I'm going to start getting a few colors here. Mostly fixed. We got a manager who's probably fixed. How about advertising? Does that change with the amount of product going in and out of the door on a given day? No, you put your Sunday ads, that's a fixed cost. Equipment. Fixed. Fixed, right? Not the equipment price that you've got a cooler. Again, I kind of want to think on today's business. What can change? What's going to vary? Vendors, I'm guessing this is cost to vendors we might have been kind of committed to. Uh, this one might not be, this one's kind of, I'm just going to even kind of cross that one off because we kind of haven't captured the vendor for the inventory and I mean I think that's what we were getting at there. Lifts would be the equipment again, that's probably fixed. Fryers would be fixed. Damages? Yeah, I think it would That would the probably fire, vary, right? Yeah. If it's a busy day and there's more people then we might start to see more of that. That could start to be some sort of variable cost that varies with the amount. The amount of water would probably be fixed. Insurance. Fixed. fixed. You pay your bill. It doesn't matter if you sell 1,000 items or 100,000 items. Your insurance is going to be the same. Depreciation would be fixed, which would be kind of a uh, more or less a tax maneuver anyway. Um, stealing. <coughs> that's probably variable. If it's fixed, I'd be concerned. All right. So, all I'm trying to do here is think about the things that vary and do not vary with food, or with the quantity of business that we're doing. So let's write that out. We don't even need to maybe go much further. Hopefully you're starting to get the gist of it. So, what costs vary with quantity, and which ones are fixed. Let's just leave that as a question mark. That was kind of the exercise we went to, through. My green circles are the fixed costs. My red ones are the variable costs. And we're, because this is econ class, we're going to quickly turn this into some equation goggles and say that our total cost could be broke down now into total variable cost plus total fixed cost. I think in theory we can do this exercise with any business and again some of them might be split like we might have some utilities that are variable some that are fixed so but in theory we could go through that exercise and think about what varies and what does not vary. So we're going to separate our total cost into total variable cost and total fixed cost. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, this is different than what we did before, so I want to make one little note here. This is a bit different, potentially, than our implicit-explicit cost distinction. So this is different, it can be related, but different than our implicit explicit cost distinction. So just be careful that they're not one and the same. It's possible that some things could be in both camps over here. There could be an implicit cost or an explicit cost that's fixed, and the same thing with variable. All right. Now, um, a lot of times it's convenient to express things in terms of the average cost per unit. I mean, if we think back to this equation, why would that be helpful if we think of um, this price times quantity, I'm going to just put it without that summation sign here. Why might it be convenient to think about averages? Gives a trend, maybe. Okay. So when we take the average, what are we looking at? How do we calculate the average total cost, for instance? Suppose we've got $120,000 worth of cost if we add up all of this stuff, and there's 10,000 units that were kicked out. What's the average total cost? Ooh, now I'm really pushing you. What did he say again? Total cost was $120,000. And we kicked out 10,000 units that day. What's the average cost? Who's brave? So $120,000 worth of total cost. And we had 10,000 units. What would you say the average cost would be? 12. 12. Dollars per unit. So that's why I wanted to kind of force you to hopefully work through that mentally is to think, well, why are we doing it in the first place? We end up coming up with a per unit cost on average again, which is sometimes convenient here because we tend to price things per unit. Now we can compare our price per unit and our cost per unit by looking at the average. So... <clears throat> Um, we sometimes want to know the average cost per unit, which we will refer to as the average total cost. And here's why. If we take our property equation of price times quantity minus total cost, I can rewrite this equation like this. Price times quantity times the average total cost per unit times quantity. I'm slipping in a few things here. But if our average cost was 12 bucks a unit, right? We had 10,000 units. 12 times 10,000 gave us our 120,000 back of total cost. So that's, that's a legit maneuver. And since we all are comfortable with our equation goggles on today, what can I do with this equation from a math standpoint? When I've got, feel, feel free to stand up guys. Sorry, I'm getting kind of low here. I'll try to move that up if you need to see. What can I do with that? I can divide by Q. I can divide by Q. 
or factor it out to re-express it a little bit differently, right? If I did it, if I divide by Q, I'd be, have to do to the other side too. All I want to do is rearrange this, and I'll do it up here so you guys can see. The uh, we can take price minus average total cost times quantity. And now what we've really got is the profit per unit. So this is another way to express our profit equation, thinking about the average cost per unit, the price per unit, and then the number of units. Makes sense, right? We're, we're in the business of looking at profits. I take the difference between those two and I get it. All right. So now, staying on the equation goggle theme, let's write this equation back out. Total variable cost plus total fixed cost. In order to get the average cost per unit, what did I do with this number? What did I do with the total cost to get my answer of the average cost of 12? Divided by Q, right? So if I take this number and divide it by Q, I now have calculated the average total cost. So there's kind of your formula for average total cost. What I do to one side of the equal sign, I must do to the other side of the equal sign. And I could divide everything by Q, but I'm going to skip that step because when there's an addition sign here, I can distribute that to both parts. Divide this by Q, divide this by Q. And now we're starting to pick apart these unique differences that are important in the profit maximization process of what can I change, what can I not change, what's fixed, what's variable, and I get that the average variable cost of production is uh, along with the average fixed cost equals the average total. So you need to have, I would recommend memorizing for starters, this box. So this box has about, oh, five or six different things going on with it that you'll see as you work through the homework problems. So what's the formula for average variable cost? Boom, it's that. Average variable cost equals total variable cost divided by. So that's one equation. There's another equation. Average fixed cost, total fixed cost. There's another equation. One, two, three, four. The sum of the total variable and total fixed equals the total. And the sum of the averages equals the average. So you got about five equations all wrapped up, five formulas all wrapped up into one nice little package. Hopefully you'll actually learn and know and come to maybe even love these formulas. But at a minimum, memorize them. Be able to regurgitate that. Just commit yourself to memory that, uh, those formulas. All right. What do these look like graphically? What do these look like graphically? I want to start off with the fixed cost. Now look at what I did here. This is an important little change that we're going to make to the graph. What have we normally been drawing here? Price. That's when we were dealing with supply and demand. Really what a price is is just a dollar value though, right? So in general it's just dollars. Because now we're going to start graphing costs and price and supply and demand. We're going to start mixing and matching a, a number of different concepts together. So we'll start to put just a dollar sign on the vertical axis, but don't be too afraid of that. So if of our $120,000 worth of costs that we had at our business, if $60,000 of that represented fixed costs, what does that graph look like? Straight line, right? So at 100 units of production, my fixed cost is 60,000. 
at 1,000 units of production. My fixed cost is 60,000. 60,000, 60,000. If we draw all of these, we get our total fixed cost function that is perfectly flat at the $60,000 worth of fixed cost. What does the average fixed cost curve look like? What does the average fixed cost curve look like? Upward sloping. No? Because the cost is constant, but where the quantity being bought changes. So it's changing, yes. The quantity is growing. So it goes down. So bigger and bigger quantities, so it's going down. All right, that's okay, Kelly. I'm glad. To, in fact, I'm going to give you an extra credit point. Okay. <laughs> so Kelty gets an extra credit point for a wrong answer. She was totally point blank wrong, but I just want to say that I love wrong answers. You guys don't give me enough wrong answers, so I want to reward a wrong answer once in a while. Seven. So, because a lot of you were maybe thinking that too. So. Average cost of producing a thousand units is what? Six, Six bucks. Hundred units. Sixty. Sixty. So I'm just picking out a couple numbers here. If we take a thousand units and we calculate sixty thousand divided by a thousand equals. 60,000 divided by 1,000 equals 60. 60. So we get a 60 over here. And 100, or 60,000 divided by 100, 600. So that number would be up here somewhere. And again, we're not drawing this to scale. But if you carefully map this out, you're going to get a curve that's approaching the horizontal axis but never gets there. So the average fixed cost curve is downward sloping and it's kind of curved heading towards the horizontal axis but never gets there. So the vertical height, I guess the one thing I want to emphasize right here is that the vertical height is the amount of the average fixed cost. This is how we start to use these graphs. If I want to know the average fixed cost of producing 1,000 units, I go up to the average fixed cost curve, hang a left, and read off that number. The average fixed cost of producing 1,000 units is 60 bucks. The average fixed cost associated with producing 100 units is $600. I go up to the average fixed cost curve, hang a left, and read off that number. All right. We will leave it there for today and pick up with more of that on Friday.